I'm Dan McKay. I work at the Albuquerque Journal. I um, graduated in 1999. I'll go ahead and just let you know how old I am. Um, and I uh, have been covering uh, City Hall, uh, a version of the City Hall beat basically at the Journal and county government since 2000. Uh, right after I graduated from college, I went to a newspaper in West Texas, a small newspaper, the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. And I also covered politics and government there. Um, so, uh, you know, feel free to a ask questions if you guys want or ask them at the end. Um, I'm not a professional public speaker. Um, meetings are uh, an important part of the beat, unfortunately. I cover probably um, at least a meeting a week. Um, I cover city council meetings, which happen on Mondays typically, although this month uh, they're actually, there's one on a Wednesday because I think there's a president, President's Day. But uh, I cover city council meetings, which are twice a month usually, uh, sometimes more during the budget seating season. County commission meetings are also twice a month. So I've got you know, a, a, about four meetings a month. Um, and they are a great way to get ideas. The government is uh, required to do things, especially when it comes to setting policies, it's required to do it in public. So um, if the city is gonna have a new policy related to immigration or um, uh, if it's gonna approve a new Walmart or zoning rules for adult bookstores or you know anything that has to happen in a, in a public meeting. Um, so Gwyneth asked me to say or to answer why journalists are obligated to cover public meetings. Um, and I would say that, that there are, um, I'll back into that a little bit, but one of the important things that it does is that I think that journalists do change public officials' behavior just by our presence at public meetings. Um, I, I, I'm frequently at meetings or I'll arrive at a meeting and um, you can just kind of tell that the people on the board there or city council or whatever group you're covering that their behavior changes a little bit and they start to um, they start to take more care in explaining why they're doing what they're doing you know it's obvious that they want to make sure that people have their side of things um, sometimes they're very insulting um, you know there is occasionally uh, uh, of a combative relationship between reporters and the people they cover um, one example and and so frequently public you know officials they will uh, they'll comment on our coverage during the meetings and point out what they think are the shortcomings and that kind of thing um, a good example of that for me was uh, um, Michael Weiner he was a county commissioner in 2012 and we wrote about his uh, um, he took a trip to, uh, or he was photographed in the red light district of uh, a city in the Philippines um, with uh, really young women. And uh, it was a freelance photographer who was documenting sex tourism. Um, so he was photographed in kind of a, an embarrassing situation, I guess. And we rewrote a lot about it. and. Uh, so he would frequently, you know, attack members of the newspaper in public. Not me personally. He would, you know, maybe criticize the coverage, but he would say talk thing, say things about how, uh, you know, so and so got divorced, and I hear he sleeps around, and all this other stuff. So I think that, anyway, it's a good example to me that that politicians, especially, they're always very aware that we're there at the meetings, and I think it does does affect how they how they behave, um, it, and I think also. It's important to point out that the agencies that don't get a lot of coverage, um, at least routine coverage, they end up, uh, they quite often end up in a scandal involving poor management or corruption or bad ethics, that kind of thing. Um, the, these little agencies that reporters never go to and that don't get any scrutiny, like a housing authority or um, the treasurer's office in the state and the county have, have all had problems where you know, they operate out of sight for a long, long time, and then once people start paying attention, you discover that there are, there are a lot of problems. Um, so besides government ethics, I think it's also important that we cover meetings because it helps people learn about projects or um, 
proposals that they're interested in ahead of time so they can weigh in. Um, you know, usually something doesn't just show up on the on an agenda and then it gets passed right away. It, sometimes it works its way through committee meetings or it'll start at the planning commission and then move its way up. So um, I think one of the things we have to do is, um, you know, it may not be that exciting, but if someone's going to build a Walmart, you know, at the intersection near your house or something, that's something that people care about and they want to have a chance to weigh in. So if we write about it, that um, that that helps, um, and sometimes it can be something really simple. Uh, you know, one of the challenges of covering a meeting is realizing just because it's something I'm not interested in, it could be something that other people are interested in. Um, a good example of that for me was I ended up writing a lot last year about roundabouts. Um, do you guys know what those little traffic circles are? There are some in in UNM. So uh, the city. Well, traffic planners like them a lot. They end up slowing down traffic, and um, that reduces the severity of accidents and things like that. Um, but there are a lot of people, as I learned, who really, really hate roundabouts. Um, so, uh, you know, it didn't seem that exciting, but it was important to these neighborhood groups in the North Valley where this roundabout was proposed. And then it also kind of became a broader symbol of, uh, of planning and what kind of city we want to have and what measures should we do that are pedestrian friendly and that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of times you can, you can see something that seems sort of silly, but it becomes kind of a broader symbol of interest to people um, to argue over. So in terms of covering a meeting, um, I think you've already gotten a lot of good advice. Uh, you know, the, f the most important thing probably is to look at the agenda beforehand. Um, the New Mexico has uh, open meetings rules that require agendas to be pu published in advance. So um, y you should always be able to see an agenda beforehand. And I would check online. If you're going to cover a regents meeting, you know, click around on the UNM website. If you're going to go to city council, it's cabq.gov. I mean, Google will help you find pretty much anything you need to find. Um, and a, another really handy thing is, uh, I don't know whether UNM does this, but the county does and the city to some extent is they publish staff reports and other information where they kind of analyze the agenda item. So if you look at, uh, so if you're going to cover, say, say the Regents meeting is going to take up the budget or something, a lot of times they'll have a PDF of a staff report that you can call up that, that explains a little bit about the budget and um, will give you some background that's, that's good to use for your stories. Um, I would, generally I go into a meeting knowing what I'm going to write about. Um, I, I do things probably, uh, well, I have some advantages that you guys won't have, probably, which is that I talk to all the city councilors and the county commissioners all the time and the mayor. So um, I have a sense of what kinds of things they're interested in and what kinds of things they expect to, to, um, to come up and get a lot of attention. Um, so, but, but my suggestion in any case would be to, to pick an item that, that you think is the most interesting. Um, and to plan on, to, so, so research one item, also pick up a backup, pick a backup item because the first one might be, uh, might get postponed without discussion or something might happen. So, so I would pick, uh, pick an item and a backup. Um, do, you, you can look on, uh, uh, on the journal website, KOB, KRQE, all the TV stations, the alibi. Um, or just do a Google News search. You can and look for whatever's been written about this topic before. If it's, um, you know, a tuition increase at UNM or something, there's there's probably going to be other media, other reporters who've written about it. Um, the a, another good thing to do when you first get get to a meeting is um, is you want to write down who's sitting where at the meeting table. Um, if, uh, especially if you don't know them, you know, the first thing I do if I go to cover a meeting and it's a group that I don't know of, um, you know, I try and, they, they almost always have placards um, identifying who the person is at, at each spot. So, 
So I usually I write down who's sitting where, what they look like, so I can remember, you know, okay, the tall, light-haired guy is, you know, Brad, whoever. Um, so you want to double check the spelling of their name, where they're sitting, um, because uh, you you have to be able to say who's who's saying what. Um, you know, if you are going to use a direct quote or quote someone directly, you do want to be able to say that. You want to be able to identify the speaker correctly, and it is um, it's it's really bad if you put the quote in the wrong person's name. So you have to be absolutely certain you know who's speaking. Um, in your notes, I usually use initials, but I you know for Debbie O'Malley is is the county commission chair right now. Anytime she speaks, I write down D O M and then whatever she has to say. Um, I a lot of times I'll I'll write down what time a discussion begins. Because then it's useful to say, uh, you know, the city council debated the roundabout for two and a half hours or whatever. Um, so it's ha helpful to know when it starts and when it ends. Um, it, and I noticed that you guys were discussing a little bit about checking audio. I, um, I, at a city council or county commission meeting, I have my own little press box, so I sit up there and, with my laptop and and uh, take. No I can take notes a lot faster typing than I can writing. Um, so in that case, I don't normally record the I don't normally record the meeting. Although those meetings are archived on the city and county website, so I can go check them later if I need to. Um, but I can I can certainly take notes well enough in short bursts to get exact quotes. Um, and I put quotes around it in my notes so I know that that I'm not paraphrasing someone. So a lot of times I'll just take notes as paraphrasing what somebody's saying. Sometimes I'll hear them say something, and I'll put quotes around it so I know oh, that's when I can go back and use the exact words. Um, if I'm at a meeting, oh, and if you guys do go to a city council or county commission meeting, you're welcome to go up in the press box. Um, the, uh, there aren't that many reporters covering local government anymore, so there's plenty of room for you to sit up there. I'm not sure we could fit all 50 people, but if some of you show up, you're welcome to sit up there. Um, if you go to a, a, a regents meeting or something where you don't have your own area, um, you know, you'll probably take notes by hand. Um, in those cases, I do usually record the meeting because I'm not uh, fast enough with my hand to, uh, to, to get all the notes I want. Um, and I take, I used to use a digital recorder. Now, lately I've been using my iPhone. Um, it just, it just kind of depends. Uh, but I write down, you know, when I hear somebody say something, or just periodically, I'll write what time it is on my on my recorder, so I can go back and double check the quote or or uh, transcribe it later if I need to. Usually, you have to move so quickly that you can't go back and listen to the whole thing. So you, it's it's handy to note a couple places where you want to get stuff. Um, let's see. A lot of the most interesting comment comes in public public comment. Um, the, the city and county allow people to speak generally uh, at the beginning of a meeting, usually. Anyone can talk um, and on any topic. So you'll have people who get up and they talk about um, police corruption, or uh, they talk about the benefits of drinking urine. Um, they talk about how CYFD took their children away. Um, there are lots of crazy people who testify. Um, Dan, I think we're ha uh, that a good number of these students in this class are going to the Police Oversight Commission meeting. Okay, the Police Oversight Commission, you'll see some of that. Um, there's a guy who has a really loud hearing aid that buzzes. And so anytime he sits near me, I have to move to the other side of the room. But anyway, he has a thick kind of Eastern European accent. You'll probably run into him, Tad. Tad Dominski, I think is his name. Um, uh, so I mean, this probably doesn't affect your story. But uh, the I think one of the things that people are surprised at is how harsh the public is to the, um, to, to, to the city council and the people serving and the POC. Um, at, at the POC, you'll probably hear people accuse, um, you know, they'll accuse the, the police of, of being murderers. Um, there will be people who've had their, um, who've had family members shot and killed uh, by police officers. That's been a huge issue in Albuquerque. Um, and they will, you know, they cry at the podium. They, you know, beg the city council to do something. 
Uh, some of them are angry and they turn right to the police chief and, and you know, uh, you know, basically accuse him of murdering their family members or allowing his people to murder their family members. Um, they get accused of corruption, all kinds of harsh things. Um, and, and one thing uh, Gwyneth asked me to touch on is when you want to quote someone and when you don't. Um, generally, I try and use some discretion in uh, someone making a specific allegation. Like uh, there's one guy who will frequently accuse counselors of accepting bribe. Well, he'll basically accuse them of being on the take. Yeah, pay to play, which means accepting cash or contributions in exchange for giving out contracts. So that kind, that's kind of a specific allegation. So when he says that kind of thing in a public meeting, I don't, I don't really, I don't write about it because uh, he needs. Um, well, that's the kind of thing that requires more investigation to flesh out, you know. And I just don't want to willy nilly let people accuse other people of corruption without um, some evidence, especially if it's specific. Um, and this person, he he doesn't have any evidence. Um, the other than his suspicion. So, but if somebody's saying their their opinion, I mean, if you've got a, a mom who's talking about how her her child or, or her you know son was murdered, well, murdered isn't the right term, but it, it, she might say murdered, but shot. You know, someone who's been killed by police, you know, in a SWAT situation or or whatever, um, and she's talking about her anguish or her grief. You know, those are good things to to quote because they're powerful and they let people understand that. Uh, um, uh, well, they might, uh, it helps the reader understand that these are real people, you know, who, uh, who die in these, these clashes with police. Now, it may be that the shooting was justified, but um, even if that's the case, it's still also true that that person probably had family members who care about them. Um, so in public comment, if you are going to quote one of these people, you should, you should go up afterward and um, uh, even during the meeting, I'll go up and I'll just kind of whisper to them, ask, tell them who I am, identify who I am, and ask them if they can spell their first and last name for me. Um, you, you cannot quote anyone unless you know exactly how to spell their name. I mean, you, that, well, you, you'll be fired if you get those kinds of things wrong. Um, the, so, I'll, so first and last name. Also, if you can get any other information about why some other description of why they're speaking. If uh, in some cases it'll be clear because someone will say, you know, I'm I'm the brother of the person who was shot, um, or they'll say I'm uh, the president of X neighborhood association. Um, sometimes it'll be clear, but other times it won't be clear. And so if you want a way to um, identify them, you should, you know, maybe ask them what their occupation is or where, you know, if you're writing about a tuition increase. You, you probably want to identify whether someone's a student or um, an employee or what. Um, you know, so some other description that can go with their name. Um, or at, at bare bones, you could say what town they're from, you know, if they're an Albuquerque resident or they live in the Northeast Heights or whatever. Um, let's see. So a after, when you, know, when you cover these discussions, um, I tend to err on the side of taking a lot of notes. Um, and if I'm unsure about something after the vote, you know, when a vote is taken, you're going to want to make sure you watch to see who's raising their hand yes and who's raising their hand no. Um, and if you're not sure, which you probably won't be if it's a body you haven't covered before, you should go up and ask the staff. There's usually somebody, you'll see somebody who's taking notes uh, at POC meetings. You know, there, there will be clerks there at the front who you could go ask. Um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that, that these three people voted yes and these three people voted no. Um, so, so double check anything you're not sure about. Um, I would always assume that the people you're writing about are going to read your story um, and call you if you got anything wrong. So, you know, when in doubt, I would leave something out if you're not certain or double check it. You know, it's not worth getting something wrong because you were too eager to put in something that you didn't understand. Um, although the best thing is is to check it to go um, to go ask someone. If you see uh, if someone says something dramatic, like if the president says uh, the UNM president says, you know, we're going to run out of cash, we're going to run out of money this summer if we don't raise tuition. Um, you 
might want to go up to him or her afterward and say, hey, I think I heard you say this. Is, do I have that correct? I just want to make sure I understand that. Um, or if you can't get to that person, you could go ask another reliable person, like one of the staff members up front. You could say, I think I heard the president say you know, this. Did, did, did I get that down right? Um, that probably the, most, the best tip for covering a meeting um, is going to be to pick one item. Um, you know, these city council meetings are six hours often, you know, six or seven hours. Um, you can't cover everything. And uh, they, might, they might take a dozen votes, and I only write about one of them. And that's OK. I mean, you have to, uh, it's better to focus on one thing and explain it than to try and cover a bunch of ground and do a bad job with a bunch of other things or get things wrong. Um, so my suggestion is, is, especially if you're writing a 300-word story or something like that, is it really only needs to cover one topic, in my opinion. Um, you, it's always easy to start with the action. If you, um, you, you know, sometimes I have to write really, really fast, and so that means just kind of a basic story. And it, you know, if you have to, you can say, the University of New Mexico Regents approved a plan to do X, Y, Z. Or you can do, they rejected a plan to do X, Y, Z. I mean, you, there are kind of formulaic ways to do it. You can just say, what the body is, whether they approved or denied it, and then whatever it was they were doing. Um, there, I mean, if, if you have time, you may spend more time writing it better or trying to come up with a better introduction. But that's kind of a quick, easy way to do it. And if you guys are writing a short story, you often you don't have much time to do, to do anything except, say, the basics. Um, you, quotes are really going to help your story, usually. Um, they. Uh, you don't have to use too many, but uh, you know, in a short story, I'd, I will probably try and quote one person on each side. If, if it's a bill where people are supporting it and people are against it, then it's easy to just maybe summarize the arguments for and against and include a quote from a particular person who said something interesting about it on each side. Um, sometimes there are more than two sides, so you also want to keep in mind that there might be reasons. There might be, some people might support something for one reason, and other people might support it for a different reason. You might think of also trying to be open-minded about what the different sides are. Um, I think that one of the most important things that I had to learn was that it's OK to leave things out. You're going to have to leave things out. Um, it's up to you to decide what is most essential for people to know um, within the space you have. Um, you know, my, it, it, it's a constant fight. Newspaper reporters, um, we do more on the web now, but we still, when we're writing for the print paper, you know, we only have a certain amount of room. And um, a lot of times I feel like the editors don't care about anything except the length of the story. You know, they just want it to fit in the space, especially city and county meetings happen at night. So they've already built the whole paper, and then they just leave a little space for you. So what you write absolutely has to fit in the space. And it doesn't matter what else interesting happened. If, it, if you can't fit it in, then that's OK. You just have to hold it for another story or, or whatever. Sometimes I'll sit in a meeting, and I might have, you know, it might last five hours, and I'll only pay attention to the 45-minute debate over the item I'm interested in. The rest of it I'll just kind of half pay attention to while I'm writing my, my other story, or, or my main story. Um, in terms of picking what, what you should write about, um, you know, looking at the agenda and looking at the staff reports ahead of time, you, know, you can kind of follow what you're interested in. Um, you might look for something that's important to, that seems like it's important for people to know about. Like a budget isn't necessarily that exciting all the time, but it may have, but, but how the university spends its money is an important thing that people should know about, especially if there are changes in the way it's doing it. And it certainly can have a dramatic impact on people if they're raising taxes or um, raising fees or tuition or that kind of thing. Um, so you might look for what you think is important. Another thing would be to just look for what's interesting. Uh, maybe there's something that's not very important, but it just seems kind of quirky and interesting and like it would get people's attention. Um, 
So you could also look for something like that. Um, the, if you're kind of undecided and maybe you're watching a few items, if, if you guys don't have to write your story right away, you'll have you know, more flexibility than I do. You could sit and see which items get the most public comment. Um, you know, if a lot of people sign up for a particular bill or a particular proposal, that might be one you want to write about. Or if it generates, you know, intense discussion, that's kind of a clue that maybe that one's an important one that would be easier or interesting to write about. Go ahead. Do you write, do you personally, do you write the story as the meeting's going on, or do you just take notes and then after the meeting, you just go? Uh, um, yeah, all of those things. Um, the, it really depends on the deadlines. If, uh, if it's a meeting that's at a time when I can just take notes, I will just take notes and then write it afterward. Um, but a lot of times, you know, city council starts at 5, and then they do public comment and proclamations and things that last till like 7, and then they take a dinner break. So they don't get to things I'm interested in till 7.30 or 8 a lot of times, and they go till 11-ish. So, uh, and my deadlines are kind of staggered, so depending on what edition in the paper it goes in, you know, the earlier it's done, the more papers it gets into, the, the later it is, the fewer papers it gets into. But um, my deadlines are, you know, 9.45, 10.30, 11, 11.30 in those areas. So sometimes, um, you know, if they have been talking about something and it's 11.15, you know, and my story is due at 11.20 or whatever, I have, to, um, I have to have it written and ready to send as soon as they take the vote. So sometimes I'll, um, I'll you know, I'll, I'll be writing it as they are discussing it and, um, and trying to be ready to just kind of top the story with the action when it comes. Um, or prepare, sometimes, a lot of times, it's really clear what they're gonna do. They're just arguing about it for a long time. Um, so you can kind of tentatively map out even the top of what, it, what it's going to say. Um, so it depends. And the most challenging things are when, they, when you have to write about two items and they happen back to back. So you have to kind of write one item while you're listening and taking notes on the other. That is, um, that's the hardest part. But hopefully you guys won't have to do that. Um, A lot of things won't seem interesting on the surface, so you might want to, you know, if you might want to dig into that, you know, the staff reports or um, think about things a little carefully. And sometimes you can tease out why someone might care about it. Um, you know, a, a road project might not sound that interesting, but um, if you can find out how long the road's going to be closed during construction or um, whether it's taking all of the money in their budget for roads, you know, there are little things you, you might be able to tease out that make it more interesting to write about. Um, the, if you absolutely can't find one thing that stands out, um, you know, you you could try to tie a couple different things together if they seem thematically similar, like if they do a bunch of things that all involve financial, will have financial implications or, or involve spending or taxes. It could be that you could tie them together into a story. I don't really recommend that because it's going to get more complicated and there's more opportunity to confuse readers. I think you're better off just picking one item. Um, if you can't fill up your space with that one item, you could also do, um, this is kind of last resort stuff, but you could do it if you had to, it would be, you know, at the end of the story, you can say, in other action, the Board of Regents, and then do, you know, bullet points of they approved a plan to do X, um, and then hit a couple of different items. So we do that occasionally. We don't like to do that because then it kind of buries information deeper in the story and it's not very, not easy for the reader to find because um, the headline won't apply to all those items. Um, and then in terms of uh, 
news releases. So I've never worked in PR, um, but I do read a lot of news releases. Um, if you guys do, if you have an assignment or that ends up involving, that requires you to write a news release instead of a news article, um, they tend to be a little more positive. Um, so I, you know, the public information officer for the county often will write about the same item I do. Um, and so uh, I've noticed basically she tends to, she's, you know, picks the winning side. So whoever, you know, whatever got approved, she'll, she'll kind of just explain that one side really. Um, and she won't quote the losing side, which I think is, is okay. I mean, it's kind of a different purpose. She's trying to explain what the commission did and why it did it. And um, she's not as interested in playing up conflict, um, obviously. Um, so anyway, I, if you do write a news release, don't feel like you have to um, necessarily give both sides. You just have to, I think, give enough information for people to understand it. Um, just you can kind of look at look at it more as in a chance to tell the public what the vote was or what the action was, some general information about why it was a good thing, you know how it will affect people, that kind of thing. Um, I think that's all I have. Do you guys want to ask me any questions? Yeah, you do. Also, I wrote up all of my notes and gave them to Gwyneth, so she can get them to you guys if you guys are interested at some point. Go ahead. What's a good story like, as far as like the average on your stories and, and how long they, they run on the pages and how much do mm -hmm. you write down actually? Um, well, I could take, in terms of notes, I mean, I might end up with, I don't know, six pages of single spaced notes you know, it can be a, a lot if you're taking, you know, depending on what's going on. In the length of the story, we do things in inches, so it's hard for me to translate it exactly, but <coughs> we, we measure our stories by the column inch, by how, how long they actually fit on the page. Uh, but I'd say they range generally from 300 words would be a short one. Um, Let's see, maybe 500 words might be close to average. Um, longer stories that go on the front page, you know, might be 1,000 words or more. Um, but the paper, the paper is smaller. Um, the paper is smaller today than it used to be, so it's um, harder to get space for long things. I mean, the shorter, our stories are, are we're under pressure to keep them shorter and shorter. Um, and uh, sometimes you have to realize that people aren't necessarily going to want to read a long story just because you're, just because you took notes on it doesn't mean it has to go in your story. Um, you know, the people editors make fun of reporters who empty their notebooks into their story. Um, they don't uh, just because you write it down in your notes doesn't mean it needs to go in your story. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, if they have a fa if they if they think I got something wrong, then I double check my notes, um, or I might do a little more reporting and see if I misunderstood something. Um, I think that it's best. You know, some reporters don't want to admit that they got something wrong. Um, but you have to keep an open mind, and I think it's better to just correct something rather than, rather than just keep arguing about it if, if, if you really did get it wrong. In terms of, um, well, uh, and a lot of times people call and they're angry about, um, they want to know why you didn't mention something else. Um, and it basically comes down to the space issue. You know, I have to explain that I didn't have, I don't have enough room to get into every single argument, um, or cover every everything that came up in this meeting. Some things will have to wait for another story, um, or you know, I didn't think that a particular argument was relevant because it's um, 
you know, wasn't, uh, it didn't apply to exactly what they were debating. A lot of times you'll find that people argue over things that don't have anything to do with, uh, with what's going on. They just, whatever they're arguing over, it kind of becomes a symbol for larger things. Like the roundabout became a symbol of people who were in favor of pedestrian friendly development and urban planning and, you know, it, so it, you'd get, all those people would, were excited for that reason even though it was just a roundabout in one spot and then the opponents would get, you know, would feel the opposite, like the city was trying to, you know, force European style planning on them. Um, so a lot of times there are kind of broader arguments that, that maybe they don't fit what's at hand and you, and you leave them out. Right, we do run, we do run corrections um, on, uh, we do we do run corrections, but obviously it has to run the next day or or later. Um, if it's online, we do fix it. Um, I think usually we put a note saying that you know the story was corrected to reflect whatever. Um, but but yeah, well that I mean that goes to the point or of how important it is to get things right the first time because once once you've if it is published then. Um, you know, you'd better be ready to defend it. And we have had, we've had interns and people who, who made a lot of mistakes and then, um, you know, they're not allowed to write for the newspaper <laughs> anymore. They can keep coming to work and watching, but, uh, you know, we won't publish anything that they write. That, that order has come down before. Um, you had a question too? Yeah. Um, is there a lot of, like, breaks or is, that, is it just like a constant flow of information? Are there any, like, uh -huh. times where they'll just take a recess uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, the city council and the county commission too, they take uh, dinner breaks around seven. Um, they go eat somewhere else, so I don't, you know, I don't hang out with them when they're eating, but that's a break uh, that's handy to go ask, start asking people questions if something came up that you weren't sure about. Um, if you cover court hearings, you know, they usually take, uh, they'll usually take a break in the mid-morning or mid-afternoon. Um, and like I said, in a six hour meeting, I might only pay attention to one or two items and the rest of the time I am just kind of zoning out and working on my own things uh, and just kind of half paying attention. Um, go ahead. Do you find that um, people are willing to talk to you as a reporter? Um, if it's someone who, yes, I always identify myself as a reporter. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know, people, I guess people have different philosophies, but for me, I don't want people to be surprised that what they're telling me ends up in the newspaper. You know, I mean, you don't wanna, uh, it, you know, pe people should know that they're talking to a reporter and that I'm taking notes. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's always best to identify yourself. Um, Sometimes people may not want something in the newspaper, but maybe it, but it's newsworthy anyway. So you have to, you have to write it even if they don't like it. But um, what was the rest of your question? Are you to speak oh yeah. Um, so I'm a beat reporter, so I mostly deal with the same people over and over again: the mayor, the city councilors, you know, people like that. Um, so for the most part, they're willing. Um, to talk to me and eager to talk to me. Politicians especially, you know, they like to get their site out and they like having their names in the paper. So, so they're often eager to talk to me. Um, and sometimes they aren't, um, you know, it just depends. The, the county treasurer isn't returning my phone calls or emails or anything at this point. Um, but I still try and reach him to get his side about things. Um, sometimes people are, they really get mad at the editorials on my on my beat, you know. And so, but but politicians they're sophisticated enough for the most part to know that um, you know reporters like me we don't write the editorials. I'm just writing the news the news you know the news stories about meetings and initiatives and conflicts and things like that. Um, and they know that someone else is writing the editorials. So a lot of times, even if they're really angry at the newspaper or or our editors. Um, or the headlines, they um, are sophisticated enough to know that I don't write those. Um, and I am willing to talk to them if they think, you know, if they think I've done a bad job covering something, you know, I try and talk to them about it. Um, you know, they may not, 
change my mind, um, although they might. Um, but sometimes just being able, knowing that you're willing to listen to them helps keep up a good relationship. Um, so yeah, I would say I, for the most part, I get along with people. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking about how technology is changing a lot of things that we do in journalism. And a lot of um, public meetings now, there's a whole conversation that's happening on Twitter mm -hmm. you know, as the meeting's taking place. I know in some cases, even the lawmakers will be you know, kind of tweeting out you know, uh -huh. uh, comments and stuff like that. To what extent do you uh, either monitor that kind of chatter or engage in it? Um, yeah, Twitter is huge in the news business. I have Twitter up basically all the time during meetings. I mean, if, I, if I'm taking notes and something's going on, you know, I can't always keep up with it, or I just you know, have to let it go without being involved. But, um, but it's kind of like a news wire. I mean, you can follow. Um, you know, you can follow politicians, you can follow news sources. Um, so Twitter, Twitter is something we wrestle with a lot because there's a question of how much, if I'm at a meet, a lot of it plays into competitive things. If I'm at a meeting by myself or if something's going on that the, I think the TV re reporters aren't um, smart enough to catch on to the significance of it. And I don't mean that they're stupid, but I have more background in city stuff than they do because they have smaller staff so they cover a wider range of things. Um, whereas I, I'm able to specialize more. So sometimes I won't tweet anything about it, even though I think it's interesting because I don't want the other media to, to snap to it and then write about it before I do. Um, if it's something everybody's going to be covering, I'll occasionally tweet some of the debate. Um, let's see. I do try to make jokes. I like to make people laugh on Twitter. Um, and I use it to tweet out links to my stories. Um, I think, you know, mostly I try and realize that people are following me because they want to know about city government news. So, um, so I use it to tweet out links to my story. If, if it's a big, uh, debate, everyone's going to be watching, um, then I will, uh, try to tweet it as soon as it happens so that people know, you know, what the city council did or what the election results are or that kind of thing. Um, um, it's just my name reversed, so it's McKay Dan. And it's on this, uh, it's on this little thing if, if anybody wants to ask Gwyneth for it. It's linked on your stories, too. What's that? It's linked to your stories online. Uh, it, I know, because you look at it last night. Oh, OK, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> Now and early next week when these stories start to be due? Um, well, tonight I have two meetings. I have a county commission meeting at 4 where they're going to hear a report from the treasurer. There's been a big scandal about, actually, I probably shouldn't call it a scandal. There's been a big controversy involving investments and um, how the treasurer has invested the public's money and, and the the, the in, a lot of investments have lost value. Some of them have been sold at a loss. Um, so the county commission and the treasurer have been at odds for, for months now. And um, so there's a, a meeting. It's just kind of a routine meeting, and it might not be very interesting, where he's, he has to give a report periodically to the county commission. But it is a chance for them to ask him questions. So I'll be at that one. That's at 4 o'clock downtown. And then after that, the county commission has its regular commission meeting that starts at about 5. Um, and that one they may discuss uh, contributing some money for Innovate ABQ. That's a UNM project. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but UNM is talking about buying the First Baptist Church site down near downtown. And other governments are pitching in to make it this big economic development effort. Um, the city council meets on uh, Wednesday, I think. Not, not this week. It meets on, it would normally meet on the 17th, but I think it's the 19th. I don't know if that's too late for you, but, um, and I haven't looked at the agenda to see what's up on that one, but those meetings are usually interesting. So if you were going to go to the county commission tonight, you would do well to read all of Dan's previous stories on the trip county treasurer 
and innovate ABQ and look at the agendas for the meetings that are the meeting that's posted online. Yeah, there's and there's there meeting there's a link to meeting agendas at burnco.gov, just on the front page of the Bernalillo County website. Um, the the meetings are on TV. They may be web streamed too. Um, I don't recommend covering it by TV or video because of the problem of having questions and then needing to to ask the staff about it or to double check names and that kind of thing. You know, you wouldn't be able to do that on TV. But um, if you wanted to get a feel for it, you could. Um, it'll be on Channel 16 on. Uh, at least for cable, I don't know about about dish stuff, but um, it, and it may also be. I think it's streamed live, although I'm not sure on the web. Uh, but that would be one idea. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what the most interesting story you covered to to you was. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. See, I'm not as good at that as other reporters because I tend to forget about things. Um, I I tend I'm pretty. Short term, I'm, I'm, I tend to be focused on what I'm working on next and not thinking about past stuff very much. Um, in terms of interesting things, uh, what's that? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure I can name anything off the top of my head. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at that. Uh, I I think that the um, I think that the police shootings have been um, an incredibly <coughs> interesting and complicated story to cover um, because uh, you know there there isn't a right or wrong answer for some of this stuff. Um, you know, nowadays you can, we have technology where we see what the officer sees when they shoot someone. You know, their lapel camera often is on. So you see, you know, exactly what the officer is going through and you can see whether the guy is really raising his hand with the gun, you know, with what looks like a gun or whether he's not. Um, the, so that kind of, well, the, so it's, it's dramatic and interesting. Um, there's also been, there have been a lot of cases uh, where it looks like there's been excessive force used, you know, where somebody is down on the ground and they're kicking him in the head or doing something that's more than just what is necessary probably to, to neutralize the person or to keep them from, from harming anyone else. Um, so I don't know, the, the, I guess the police, the police stuff is probably the most interesting and important things we've done um, in city government over the last year or so. Um, but I'm a curious person, so, and I think most reporters are the same. You, you kind of get interested in whatever you're writing about. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, last year I spent a lot of time writing about abortion. Um, you know, there was that late term abortion uh, uh, ban proposal um, or a 20 week abortion ban. I guess some people would dispute whether it's a late-term abortion or not. But um, so, you, so you end up learning all kinds of medical stuff. And um, anyway, it's fun. I, get, I tend to get interested in whatever, well, all kinds of things. Dan, if you else? go to a meeting, if you get sent to some uh, board or commission you don't normally cover because something pops up there, what are some things you do to familiarize yourself with an unfamiliar body? Um, I tend to look at past stories to see what's been written about that group before. Um, if I don't know whether this is practical for you guys. It might be for some of you, depending on how many there are. But I introduce myself to people beforehand so that I get a sense of, uh, uh, we can get a sense of their personality. And it's just handy to to give them an idea that, you know, make you feel comfortable in case you need to ask them a question later. Um, and it's handy a lot of times to introduce yourself to the staffers. Um, you know, there's a kind of a, this unseen group of people who help write the legislation and who help analyze the legislation and who 
take calls from constituents. Um, so it's also interesting to talk to some of those people who aren't necessarily on the board, but who might have some insight into what's going to happen. Usually you don't quote those people on the record. And, and you should always be clear with people whether you're talking on the record or off the record. But um, a lot of times, introducing your, myself to the staff helps, helps me get a sense of what's going to happen um, and, or what things I should look out for. and, and um, that kind of thing. But it's not easy to cover something new right out of the chute. Um, and so I think just preparing as well as you can is probably the best best thing. So you might go up to uh, someone who looks like they're sort of in charge at this thing and say, hey, mm -hmm. I'm a reporter here from the journal. Of course, they're going to know mm -hmm. you're Dan McKay. But mm -hmm. if you say, hey, I'm you know, a reporter from UNM, um, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to be the biggest uh, topic they handle today? Uh -huh. It's going to be the biggest thing that happens, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, I would do that. Um, if you, um, I mean, some, some people won't talk to you before a meeting. Um, the, uh, if you end up going to a POC meeting, the, pub, the Police Oversight Commission, you know, they've got a, uh, an independent review officer, uh, an attorney, a former prosecutor named Robin Hammer. Um, who investigates police, complaints against police, and then presents a report to the commission. So she might not be willing to talk to you at length before a meeting because uh, it's kind of, she probably treats it like a judicial process where she shouldn't be saying things. But um, it never hurts to introduce yourself and say, is there any particular item you think I should be sure to take good notes on? Um, and it makes you feel better if you have to go ask them a question afterward. We really appreciate it when uh, professionals take a little bit of time and come and share their ideas with us. So 